have in this room is the inability for you to hear properly. So are you hearing me all right? Yes. Okay, good. I'll try to speak up. I'm not a real loud person, but I have learned as a nurse over the years to speak up to some people because a lot of times they didn't hear me. So if you're having trouble hearing me, do something like this. Uh, something that would give me an indication that you, you're not having, you're not having a, a good time hearing me. So welcome today, ladies. Welcome to our a building, but welcome more to this body, which is really what the church is. It's people. It's all of us. And I'm so grateful and I'm so thankful for this church body uh, that has ministered to me already in many, many ways. Uh, we've only been here about a year and a half. But by God's grace and his plan for our life, he knit us together with this church body. And I am so grateful. We're so thankful to be able to be here. What a gift it has been to us, truly. I don't say that lightly, and I do not say that uh, <clears throat> as something that, you know, let's just all <clears throat> feel good about it. I'm, I'm so grateful that it is, it is a gift to be able to be here and to minister to this church body. And you know, they've ministered to us in so many ways. I am so thankful today for the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's done in my life and how he has continued to perform that good work in my life. The subject today is a compassionate woman, or the theme has been, uh, or, or is, a compassionate woman. So why in the world did I choose that? It's kind of broad, isn't it? Wow, we could talk about that all day. So I'm gonna to try to narrow it down to just a basic, simple explanation based on some examples from God's word. But before I continue, let's bow our heads and close our eyes and ask God to help us. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We have prepared for it. And we ask that you would open our hearts and open our minds. Lord, may our spiritual eyes be open. Help me, Lord, uh, now as I share my heart as far as what you've taught me. I am weak and I am needy, Lord, and you know that. So I ask that you would help me today. Thank you so much for everyone that came today, that they took time out of their busy schedule to be here. Thank you for the ladies that prepared, that made food, that set the tables, Lord. They did that because they love people, and uh, I am so grateful for that. So we honor you, and we give this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So this thought is kind of broad. It's a broad theme. Compassionate women. Compassion. What is compassion? In scripture, it gives us a very definite definition, and that can be found in a lot of a lot of scriptures. In fact, the word compassion is mentioned or in God's word over a hundred times. Isn't that amazing? And it's very specific. Some people say, oh, compassion is love, Colleen. Well, that's a little more than that. Compassion is being nice. It's a little more than that. Compassion is being fruitful for Christ. It's a little more than that. I've been reading in the Gospels. I have a Bible study at my house on Tuesday nights, and there's these precious ladies that gather. We've gotten to know each other better, and I, that's the favorite thing for me. Some of you come that are sitting right next to me. And we've been studying the Gospels, and in the Gospels, and particularly in Matthew chapter 9, where I'm trying to narrow this down to something very specific. In Matthew chapter 9, there are some verses that I want to focus on, as well as some others. But we've been studying this, and there are many, many accounts in the Gospels of Jesus' active and personal ministry. And it's recorded for us in his word. And so we catch a very small glimpse of Christ's compassion for people. And some people think, well, you know, he went about preaching and teaching many villages and towns of his day, places that he knew well, but the recording of that is maybe this much. He did so much more that wasn't recorded, and scripture teaches about that. 
So when you hear the word compassion, what do you think of? Do you see a mother with her child? Do you see a caregiver with a patient? Do you see an adult child with ailing, aging parents? Do you see a rescue mission? Do you see infants being rocked and held? So there's lots of pictures that we can see. I want to tell you about a little picture in my mind that, that I was thinking about uh, when I was trying to think of who's been touched in my life with compassion. I thought about my dad. My dad grew up in upstate New York, Penyon, born in Penyon, New York, and a beautiful area in the Finger Lakes. And at about 11 years old, at a, in a very healthy home, went to church. His mother and father were very, very involved in their church ministry. About 11 years old, his dad decided that his family wasn't enough for him, and he left them. So my dad was left without a dad. For most of his life and had people not been compassionate to him he probably would have floundered and failed and my grandmother would have had no home because in the early mid to early 40s it was a difficult thing for divorce to happen in a family it was very difficult it was unusual and it was you didn't talk about it you didn't talk about it so my dad came from a broken home his life could have been a disaster, but in compassion, people touched his life. People took them in. My dad then grew, gave his life to God, became a pastor, and the story goes on. But I think without the compassion of people in his life, his grandparents, my grandmother, his own mother, he would have floundered. He would have been a mess. He would have been... Uh, had a divided mind as far as serving God because that thing that happened to him was very difficult. He grew up the rest of his life without a father. And really, that father was not attentive, even as my dad grew. Uh, but my dad did try to reach out to his, his own father later in life. But somebody came into my dad's life, and that was his father-in-law. My father-in-law, or my grandfather on my mother's side, came in, scooped up my dad, and loved him like a son. Like a son. My grandfather was Thomas Keegan. He was Irish, very Irish. Born and raised in Dublin, Ireland. And he had kind of a brogue, but he tried to change that because it wasn't acceptable for him to come over to the States with a brogue in, those years, in, those, in that time. So he was a fiery evangelist. So I come from, uh, you know, a history of people that served, that knew Jesus and served in ministry. And um, I'm so thankful that somebody showed compassion to my dad. His life would have been different. My life would have been different. Totally different than what I know. So in, in every example of compassion in God's word, it's not just a feeling. There's always an action. Somebody acted and took in my dad and his mother and cared for them. So it's an action because compassion acts to move toward a person, to feel pity and to see a need, but then to act in some way to meet a need. It's not just something like, oh, you know, I, I feel so bad for her, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Well, let's pray. I feel so, I, I feel so, so you feel pity, but compassion is much greater because compassion moves toward a person and touches their life. So in Matthew chapter 9, there's a great emphasis on what Jesus did, um, and not just what he taught, although they were amazed by what he taught, because he had authority. Jesus reached out to a paralytic in the first far, part of um, chapter 9. Jesus stepped onto a boat, crossed over, and came to his own town. Some men brought him a paralytic, a paralyzed man lying on a mat and when Jesus saw their faith he said to the paralytic take heart or have good cheer in some other translations it says your sins are forgiven so he saw them later in in the chapter in verse 9 it says Jesus went on from there and he saw a man named Matthew at the tax collector's booth 
And he said to him, follow me, Jesus chose him. And, and Matthew got up and followed him. And in many other passages, when we talk about the, um, the movement of Christ toward people, he saw them, he went toward them, he touched them, he influenced their life. So many times in the gospel accounts, there's an act of, of compassion but sometimes those acts of compassion are met with cynicism. But what's cynicism? We've talked about a definition of compassion. Pity, feeling that acts, moves towards a person. And so a cynic is somebody in the opposite. <laughs> Mistrusting, doubting, the critic. Jesus had them. And unfortunately, what we read in the scripture is he faced uh, criticism and cynicism wherever he went. He says, why are you healing on the Sabbath? Why are you going to that woman? Why are you touching them? They're unclean. And so there's always the cynic. I, I, from what I see lately in our society, in our culture, a lot of cynicism, isn't there? There's a lot of hatred vile acts of people. There's a lot of mistrust. Mistrust. And hopefully that doesn't creep into our lives just because we're so influenced by our culture, aren't we? Mm -hmm. We're so influenced to be the opposite of compassionate. And so we can become very hardened, very cold, very cynical, very, very disgruntled. And that's the worst thing to be as a believer. So Jesus went about the cities and villages anyway, in spite of the criticism. It didn't hinder him. It didn't, he didn't stop what he was doing. And some accounts or examples is, is when he encountered the very depth of human need. He healed uh, the blind man. He, he saw a dead girl and a, or a sick woman and healed her. He healed the blind um, and then at the, at the end of chapter 9, it's kind of a wrapping up of this chapter. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. And this is a very very um, intimate view of the word compassion. In the Greek, it's actually a two-sided meaning. And it's used, uh, and it's a profound word that's actually used in this chapter, and more profound than others. And it says that he was moved with compassion. And it's the strongest word that's ever been translated for pity in the Greek language is right here in Matthew chapter 9. Um, it describes the compassion with moves a man to the deepest depths of his feeling. It's twofold where it says there's feeling, but there's something in the gut. In the gut. He felt it deeply in his, in his being. And William Barclay, a theologian in a commentary that I read, said it describes, quote, it describes the compassion which moves a man to the deepest depths of his being. Compassion. He was moved with compassion. And so um, the critics were great when Jesus went from village to village, proclaiming that he was the Messiah and he was showing compassion by healing the sick and meeting physical needs and proclaiming the gospel. So, how about you? Have you become cynical in this culture that we live in? I hope not, but it's easy. It's easy to be influenced, isn't it? You, all you have to do is watch the news, and you're like, you go to bed, blah, 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 blah. grumbling, complaining, um, shutting ourselves off from pe certain people or certain people groups. In Colossians 3, verses 12 and 13, that there's a, and there's an earlier verse in there, I'm going to Scoop my Bible over here and get to that. I can't see unless I put these on. 
because I'm old. So, um, <clears throat> so it says that he wants us to put off anger, rage, malice, filthy language from our lips, and don't lie to one another, but instead, instead, having compassion, putting on. So we're putting off something, all those things that I just mentioned, and we're putting on, we're clothing. The verse actually says, clothe yourselves with compassion. It should be the first thing that people see. So clothe ourselves with compassion. And, and having compassion, like I said, is mentioned over 100 times in Psalm 86. There's a prayer of David, and he, he extols the, the, um, the great things about God. He's also asking for help so many times in Psalms. There's a lament. There's a cry out to God. And this is what David is doing. Hear, O Lord, answer me. I'm poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am devoted to you. You are my God. Save your servant who trusts in you. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. You are forgiving and good, O God. O oh Lord, abounding in love to all who call to you. Hear my prayer, O oh Lord. Listen to my cry for mercy. In the day of my trouble, I will call to you, you, for you will answer me. Among the gods, there is none like you, O oh Lord. No deeds can compare with yours. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, O oh Lord. They will bring glory to your name, for you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. And the chapter continues to extol the Lord in all of his attributes. And it says then in verse 15, after continuing on in the chapter, for you, O Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. <laughs> So David had a heart cry, but then he always refers back to who God is. He was desperate, calling out to his God. And I'm sure you've been there too. I have. <clears throat> so if we look at scripture, and if we understand the compassion of Christ, we always need to have a response. So a lot of times in scripture, it's, there's comparison and contrasting. There's always, there's a lot of that in scripture. A lot of it is, don't do this. Do this. Here's what you used to be. Here's what I want you to be. And so we have to take this passage and take the many, many times that Jesus showed compassion to people and turn ourselves away from the criticism and the cynicism of this world. So we need to show compassion to those that are in need, emotionally, spiritually, physically. Sometimes we can make it very, very academic. We know the, we know the definition, we understand the stories, we've heard them a lot of times, but compassion is very personal, very, very personal. I am a registered nurse. I work from home now, but for many years, I worked in the hospitals on the floor, right down in the thick of it. And compassion for me was always personal. It was a job that I had to do, but there was a person in that bed with a name, with a history, with a need. Most of it was physical, but you know, you can't take that away from the emotional trauma that they were feeling or the spiritual trauma that they went through. And so it was very personal. At one time we had um, a group of ladies in a, one hospital that I worked at, and um, they used to come in and, and uh, I used to kind of not want to see them coming because they would step into a room and kind of interrupt my plan. And my purpose for that day was to get done. But it was hard to get done. But they would step in and they would talk to some of the people and, and uh, give them books to read, give them magazines. But one thing happened that I loved. They had lavender hand cream. And you're saying, Colleen, big deal, right? 
But what happened was that it became very personal for them to distribute this hand cream to the elderly patients. Some of them were not doing well mentally, not, of course not doing well physically, they were in the hospital, they had to be. They would go in, they would speak to these elderly people, they would get out the lavender hand cream and they would start to rub their hands. They would take their hands and apply the cream and rub it and massage and talk to them. So the fragrance was wonderful. The conversation was wonderful. But the compassion was absolutely amazing. Those patients responded to the compassion of that group of women. And you know what? It got to where I did. I was, I was thrilled when they came because they were helping us as nurses with a great need that we couldn't meet. We didn't have time. We didn't have enough time to sit down. That was the worst part of being a nurse at the hospital is I couldn't sit down and just spend a lot of time with just one person. It drove me nuts. It actually drove me crazy that I could not, I would leave there every night feeling like, oh, so many needs, Lord. So many needs, and I can't meet them all. Do you ever feel like that? Mm -hmm. Women are, by nature, the way God made them, nurturers, right? We love to nurture. We love to take care of each other. We love to take care of each other's children. We like to mingle our families together. We like to get together in groups like this. Isn't it great? Because we all have that in common. We all have a great deal of common. So if you have compassion, if you see a need, what good is it if you don't do it? What good is it if you don't do it? If you don't actually act and be a part of God's plan of being compassionate to people. It makes a difference. It makes a difference. It made a difference in my world growing up. Still does. It makes a difference. And so, you know, it's it's been a difficult week to try to, for me to, when I was studying this, to kind of narrow it down so that I didn't keep you here for an hour. And uh, it, the Lord sent me a, a little difficulty this last week. I got a really bad toothache. See, and you're all going like, oh, I can relate to that. You feel pity for me, don't you? You feel bad for me. I know you do. Because if you've had a toothache, you know that it's horrible. I've had a toothache. So can you help me with that toothache? In compassion, can you reach out to me? Not really. You can say, oh, you poor thing. I had one too. You know what I need? I need a physician. I need a physician to take a look at that and see what's wrong. Why do I have this horrible thing in my life, Lord? Why now? Why now? So I need a physician. And you know what? We have, we have a sin problem in this world. That's where all the cynics and the criticism comes from. All the, all the things that war within us are really, are really because we have a problem. And we have a problem called sin. And God says that without the redemptive blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, that sin cannot be forgiven. But because of what the Lord Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary, he paid the price for all that sin. And in trusting in him alone to remove the sin, Lord, I repent, I realize I need a savior. I need a savior. He saved us. And he cleansed us with his blood. And so when he looks on us, all he sees is his redemption plan for us. And so the great physician has brings healing to us because of what he did on the cross. There's no, there's no other way. There is no other way except through uh, trusting in Jesus Christ alone to redeem us. And, you know, personal faith in Jesus Christ alone is, repairs our greatest need. I need a physician to, like, fix this tooth. But the greatest need I ever had in my life was for Jesus Christ to, for, to cleanse me from sin and apply his righteousness to me. That's what I needed. And you know what? It wasn't being the pastor's kid. Big deal. That didn't save me, although it was beneficial in my life. I had to claim Jesus Christ as my own and understand that he alone could save me from my sin. 
And it's not joining a church. It's not being good. It's not reciting some sort of diatribe. Or, uh, it's it, because in Romans 1 it says that none are righteous. Not one of us. Not, our, our righteousness is like filthy rags. We can't bring that to God and say, boom, here you go, God. I've been the best person you could possibly ever have. Now, I deserve to go to heaven. And that's not true. That's not what the Bible teaches. Although in some faiths all around us, that's what they teach. Work your way there. Be good. And we'll, you'll surely, and if you know, if you're better, better on the scale than you were bad. If you outweigh the good with the bad, eh, you're good. And that's totally false. The scribes and the Pharisees were the critics, and that's what they believed. Obey the law. Over 600 and some Jewish laws at the time. Obey the law. And um, the rest of chapter 9 in Matthew, as we continue to read about, as I continue to read about Christ's impact and his compassion, he was moved with compassion. He goes on in that chapter. And he talks about us being active and intimately and personally involved in people's lives. And he says, Jesus went through all of the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. He was revealing that he had the power to do that. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion. It was that he saw their deepest need. Their greatest need was for understanding that the Messiah had come. He says in another passage, I fulfilled all this. I'm standing right before you. I am he. I'm the one you're looking for. And he was moved with compassion because he saw the people that my translation in the NIV says they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, and here's where he says, this is where you go and do it. This is where it gets personal. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. The compassionate ones are few, if we could like slide that in there in an application. Um, ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. A sheep, sheep without a shepherd. And he implies in that passage a reference back to the scribes and the Pharisees, which had all the laws, and yet they harassed people with their laws, and the people still had no shepherd, no one to lead them, no one to guide them. And so, in conclusion, I want to ask you today, how's your compassion ticker? <laughs> you know, have you ever seen those things that, you know, like on your toaster, it's a little line that says, you know, light, medium, dark. You turn the dial to get the right thing that you want. If you could measure yours that way, what would you do? Compassion acts. Love is something you do. Compassion is something you do. And I hope that we can have the label over our heads. Wow, those women are compassionate. They love deeply. They see a need and they meet it. And if you're here today and you really are struggling like a sheep without a shepherd, I, we would love to help you with that. If you don't have a church home, if you're not attending a church regularly where the Bible is taught, we would love for you to come here. Uh, with open arms, we would greet you. But the most important thing is there is a shepherd and it's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the savior of our souls. Have you met him? Do you know him personally or do you just know about him? We would love to explain a lot of things to you and help you through God's word to understand that more. Uh, we do have opportunities for women to come to our church here and, and be involved in a lot of different things. We have Bible studies. We have, we have a brunch. We have a Christmas tea. So there's a lot of things that we do. 
there's a lot of compassion that goes out from this church body, and I'm so grateful that I see that and that I've been able to be a part of that. And if you'll bow your heads and close your eyes with me, let's pray and ask the Lord to continue to work in our hearts. Father, we're so thankful for your example of compassion. All through the Gospels, Lord, there's, there's evidence. There's evidence of what you did. But in your compassion, Lord, you wanted them to know the truth. That you were the one that was sent. And we're so grateful, Father, that you saw us in our need. You saw it as our, as our, at our lowest point, without, without a shepherd. We're like sheep wandering, helpless. And Lord, we are helpless without you. So, so thank you, Lord, for what you've done for us. Thank you for your sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. And we thank you, Lord, that we are your ambassadors, that we can continue to share your compassion with others. And Lord, help us open our eyes. Um, help us to take off the blinders that we sometimes get from our culture. Lord, it pounds on us every day, the cynicism and the, and the difficulty of that. So Father, uh, renew our hearts today. Help us to take this with us. Lord, I want to be a compassionate woman for you. I want to see needs and meet them. And Lord, we dedicate all of this to you. You alone are God. And Lord, I pray that may the words of our mouths and the testimony of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. Yeah.